This is the World War I Technology Mechanized War Lecture. These are all the new weapons that are introduced during World War I that cause a lot of death. All right, first we have the larger battleship, the HMS Dreadnought, and uh, brought out in 1906 by the British Royal Navy. They're just very massive uh, battleships that are distinguished by their guns. Okay, they have uh, five guns, two in the back, two on the side, and one up front that could shoot large artillery shells. Okay, and they were driven by steam engines. They were heavily armored, but however, uh, very slow. And then you had the battle cruisers, which were large warships uh, developed early in the 20th century. Less armor, fewer guns than the dreadnoughts. However, they were faster because they were lighter. Um, but if they got hit, uh, they could be damaged pretty easily by other shells. All right, they were designed to fight against smaller warships attacking merchant ships. Um, you'd have merchant ships bringing supplies, say, from America to Europe. Uh, these cruisers would stand beside the merchant ships and then kind of break away towards bigger battleships trying to uh, destroy them. They were built to outrun those bigger battleships, kind of a stick and move, fire at them, and get out. Well, then the Germans came up with the U-boat and changed the whole game. All right, U-boats are underwater or undersea boot, undersea boat. Uh, it's a submarine, all right, and they're extremely successful in sinking these cruisers because the cruisers think they're safe. They're going out. They can't see an enemy. They can't hit an enemy they can't see, all right, and they're very good at torpedoing, torpedo hitting the cruisers. And during the war, Germany is going to build 345 of them. They're going to lose a little over half of them and 5,000 sailors. An extremely dangerous job was to be a part of the U-boats or be on the U-boats. Right? But like I said, they were successful. They, almost, they sank almost 5,000 5, Allied ships, all right? and which killed about 15,000 civilian lives. This is going to be what is going to happen draw America into the war is the killing of the civilians that are on these ships. How do you battle an enemy you can't see? Well, the first thing you come up with is a depth chart. All right, uh, It's kind of a, a mine that is designed to blow up when it reaches a certain depth. So the further you get down in water, the harder the pressure. And the pressure would trigger that it's this deep down and then it would explode. That would do two things. Either hit the U-boat or cause it to surface so that the cruisers could fire at it. Another way to find them was to use the hydrophone. Okay, It's an underwater microphone that would listen for U-boat action. All right? You could hear a big boat underwater moving and then you could direct the ship's pilot to the source of the sound. All right? And you could fire in that direction or drop depth charts in that area. All right, very helpful at, for the Allies to destroy these U-boats, to find them and destroy them. All right, and like I said, it was very dangerous to be on these U-boats because their life expectancy was six combat patrols. Think about that. You're going to go into action six times before you're expected to be dead. Uh, something to think about. Observation balloons, uh, big old balloons they would send up in the sky, look at all the trenches, look for enemy movement, okay, enemy ships, and direct uh, big artillery to fire upon them. Uh, very big in the sky, though, easily shot down and nowhere for these guys to go. And then the Zeppelin, a uh, bigger kind of like a blimp nowadays, uh, used for bombing by the Germans, okay, but very easily seen, very easily shot. All right, how do you hide this big thing? Drop a big bomb on here, and it's gone. They're very big, very easy to see. All right, and when they get hit, they generally burn in flames. They use the gas that's l flammable gases because they were lighter than helium, and they could lift this big thing off the ground. But anytime it hit something or got hit and a spark was caused, the whole thing would go up in flames. Not exactly the most useful thing. Then there were observation planes, right? These are going to replace the zeppelins and the balloons because a plane, a little more maneuverable and faster than the zeppelins or the balloons. And you're just going to use these to locate the enemy behind the trench lines 
At first, the pilots would exchange greetings like, hey, how's it going? We're both just doing our job, both taking pictures for our side. But then it was like, wait a minute. If he reports my guys, then my guys are going to die. So what they start to do is grab bricks and grenades, fly over top, and try and drop it on them, all right? Try and hit the engine, try and blow that engine up or blow the propeller off and sink them. And then they started grabbing pistols and rifles and actually shooting at each other in the sky. All right, and then to bring battle even further, they would attach machine guns to the front of the plane, okay? Um, they would put metal wedges onto the propeller to deflect the bullets, okay? Problem with shooting into a propeller? Well, it's A, going to scatter the bullets when they hit those metal plates, all right? B, the bullets could knock off the propeller or cause the propeller to fail, which would make the plane crash, or sometimes those metal wedges would cause the bullet to be ricocheted back at the pilot, okay? So not exactly very useful at first, all right? Um, they were mounted, so instead of mounting it necessarily to the front like this one, you would start mounting them up top of the wings uh, to get up and over the propeller or not to hit the propeller as much. Or they would start to put them at the rear of the plane later in the war. But in 1915, Anthony Fokker is going to design the interrupted gear linking the plane's gun to its propeller. Now this is genius. When you shoot the gun, it's going to cause the propeller to kind of skip, allowing for the bullets to get through the propeller. This is going to completely change the game. All right, uh, Germany is going to take control of the air, and their uh, air force is going to do very well until the Allies can figure it out and develop one of their own. And then tanks come in. All right, this is going to make trench warfare obsolete. Remember how I told you a lot of lives in this stalemate in Europe going back and forth in the trenches? All right, now you created this big, gigantic metal thing that can move across land. Not only is it big and protective, so you could throw like 20 guys on the front and have a bunch of guys behind it, you could easily move up the battlefield, jump in the trenches, and kill all of your enemy that are in the trenches. And it couldn't get stuck in the trenches because it could just ride over top and these treads would help it climb out of the trench. So you could keep moving people forward. Not to mention if you attached machine guns to it or small artillery, you could kill as it moved forward. Uh, very deadly. It's going to make the trench warfare obsolete. It's not good anymore with the invention of the tank. And you can move quickly and easily down a battlefield, killing a lot of people and saving a lot of lives. And then comes up the heavy artillery. At first, they would mount them to the mount them to rail cars and transport them down the railroad, uh, capable of firing long distances. Changes the way the war is fought. I no longer have to be on the front line to kill a lot of people. I can shoot from miles away. Take the German Big Bertha howitzer, shoots a two thousand pound shell. All right. 24 miles away. I don't have to be on the front line to kill people anymore. I can be 24 miles away and hit them. However, if you're going to attach it to a railroad uh, cart, what's the best way to stop it? You just blow up the railroads. It can't go any further. Okay, so it's going to change the way some of the way the war is fought. And then you have the Paris guns. All right, they call it the Paris gun because this large, long gun uh, was used to shell the city of Paris in 1918, killing hundreds of people and creating lots and lots of panic because where are they? How are these, how is artillery this close to Paris? Well, the artillery wasn't that close to Paris. Actually, you could shoot this 228 pound shell 78 miles away. It would go as high as 24 miles in the air, all right, reaching the stratosphere. That's a long, long ways up. However, it took an 80-man crew to run it. So if it was bombed, not only would you dismantle this gigantic gun, you would also kill 80 people with each one that you blew up. So, but totally changed the, war, the way the war is fought if you can be 78 miles away and hit your target. Then comes the most dangerous weapon during World War I, all right? The introduction of poisonous gas. All right, the Germans exceed the Allies in the use of it. The Germans used it a lot. Um, 
it's so effective that poisonous gas is looked at as being a very inhumane way to kill somebody and will be later outlawed by the Geneva Convention. All right, there's three types of gas. There's chlorine, phosgene, and mustard. All right, chlorine would cause damage to your eyes, nose, throat, lungs. All right, it's going to cause this really bad burning sensation and kind of eat away at the surface. Okay, and then it would cause death by asphyxiation. What asphyxiation is, is you're choking. You would start, you would inhale it, you would start a coughing fit. You ever cough so much that your mouth watered or you threw up? Well, try and imagine trying to still breathe after you threw up because it's still going to cause you to cough. With every cough, you're letting out air and you're going to suck air back in. Well, if you have vomit in your throat, you're going to try and breathe through that vomit and you're gonna pretty much end up vomiting all over yourself and choking on your vomit and dying that way. Imagine that. Phosgene gas, uh, most deadly of the gas, it would attack your nervous system, all right, and your lungs and your diaphragm, all right, and cause you to choke as well, as well as burn. And then mustard gas is probably the one gas you really didn't want to run into, um, could really incapacitate your enemy all right, uh, it caused lots of blistering to exposed areas, your hands, your ankles, your neck, whatever wasn't covered up uh, to cause blistering there. So think about all of your body part, all of your skin that is touching air right now, causing blisters on that. You had to have wind in order for gas to be effective because it would have to blow downstream into the trenches of the other of your enemy and these two photos show that very well this photo shows you that if you don't have the winds in your direction it's just gonna sit and linger around and come back and this gas could sit inside the trenches for days on end so think about sitting in this suit covered head to toe all of your clothing tucked in the gloves into your ankles into your mask through your neck and having to sit and breathe through this mask now if your mask fogged up how do you fight the enemy? How do you shoot your enemy when you can't see because you've been sitting in this suit for two days? All right. Um, the Germans had the most advanced chemists in the world, so they're able to develop the chlorine gas and the mustard gas. Within seconds of inhaling its vapor, it destroyed your respiratory organs, bringing on a choking fit, and you'd die from choking in a lack, lack of air, and plus the vomit and the choking on your vomit. Think about that. All right, mustard gas, it's an oily agent that would produce large burning, burn-like blisters when it came in contact with your skin. This is included to, but not limited to your eyes. So if your eyes are exposed, to get into your eyes and burn your eyes, burn your lungs. So every time you breathe it in, it would burn your armpits and your groin. So think about it. If your pants weren't tucked in and that gas seeped up your leg and got to your groin, think about trying to fight a war as you have blisters all over your midsection not fun. All right, this is just a picture of gas victims. You can see that it got to their eyes, so all their eyes are bandaged up. They're being, being led blindly out of war by one man who can see, and the rest are just touching the shoulder of the man in front of them and trusting where they're going because their eyes are burnt. All right, and then you have the machine gun, one of the best weapons of World War I. All right, uh, the first gas-operated machine gun was the Colt Browning M. 1895 the bullets actually contained exploding gas all right and then you had what the British used the 30 or the 303 inch Vickers machine gun all right uh, it was water cool cooled because the the barrel would get so red hot that you'd pump water through it and it would cool it down allowing you to keep on shooting it required six to eight men to operate extremely heavy so when you're talking about sitting in muddy trenches uh, if you're getting shot at heavily a lot of times they just abandoned them. All right, and then you had the Lewis gun, which was developed in the United States in 1911. Uh, in 1915, the British Army purchased the gun for the use in the Western War Front, used early in combat. This is the game changer. All right, this is when you have 200 men running at you and you have seven machine guns going. Not hard to kill 80 men when you're firing 40 bullets a second, or, or actually it was more like 200 to 400 bullets per second or per minute and so you could mow 200 men down very easily this is a complete game changer this is what's going to keep the men back in the trenches and then here's some of the rifles and this concludes the lecture thank you